I can't imagine how intimidating it must be to be a brand new housewife. It's never easy to be the new kid in any situation, so coupled with the fact that you're walking into an established friend group who are being paid to cause drama and you are the easy target, it must be totally overwhelming. Many housewives choose to stay out of the drama in their first season, but this is risky as there is no demand for them to return. We want the messes, not the women who maintain their dignity. So in this video, I want to pay honor to the women who came in and truly made a splash. First, I want to lay out the ground rules for what I consider to be a truly great rookie season for a housewife. First off, OGs are off the table. The dynamic is much different if everyone is brand new, so there will be no Nene Leakses, Giselle Bryants, or Camille Grammers on this list, no matter how great they were their first season. Only women who join season two or later will be considered. Second, I want to look at what the housewife did in her season. Did she breathe new life into a dying franchise? Did she bring us something we'd never seen before in a housewife? How much drama did she cause? How did the other women react to her? And my last criteria, though it's not a deal breaker to being on this list, I want to consider the quality of the season as a whole. All right, now that we've established some ground rules, let's get into the rankings. I want to give a quick shout out to some honorable mentions. First, Dorinda Medley, who many will expect to be on this list, but she's not, because while I think she was one of the greatest casting decisions and fit in like she'd always been there, there was just so much going on in Roni Season 7, especially with the return of Bethany and with such a supersized cast, that I don't believe she was as impactful this season as she would later become. She was still kind of feeling the gig out. Another honorable mention is Gretchen Rossi, whose introduction changed the entire fate of the Real Housewives universe. She was the prototype of what we expect in a gold digger, young, beautiful, and obsessed with expensive things, while caring for her ailing older fiancé. While I think she was an incredibly important housewife, it was really Tamara's reaction to her that led to the conflict-style show we know and love today. Gretchen deserves her kudos, but she didn't quite make the list. And my last honorable mention is Miss Phaedra Parks Esquire. Phaedra is one of my favorite housewives of all time, with the exception, of course, with her final act on Real Housewives of Atlanta. She brought a different type of energy to the show. She had a southern flair and was always coming up with the most hysterical sayings. She was an intellectual and had this compelling dynamic of being the lawyer married to the ex-con, one of the hottest house husbands of all time. She was also very upper crust, talking about her equestrian days and her sophisticated palate. Have you tried the foie gras tonight? Mm -hmm. Is it delicious? It is. She also brought us the best pregnancy storyline ever with her over-the-top baby shower and by lying about her due date, notably at a Mother's Day party to a table full of women who had previously given birth. While I absolutely adored Phaedra and feel like she was the jazz the show needed to bring it into its golden era, she was more of a supporting character this season, so I felt like I couldn't put her on the list properly as she wasn't in the mix as much as she would be in seasons to come. Alright, on to the list proper. In 10th place, we have Brandy Glanville, who hobbled onto the Beverly Hills scene midway through season two with one foot in a stiletto and the other in a cast. She immediately triggered all the other women with her beauty, youth, and tallness. Who's that? I don't know, she's tall. In her very first scene, we saw the other girls mean girling her. The only one who really had any substantial reason to dislike her was Lisa Vanderpump, as Brandy was acquaintances with Cedric, who at the time was LVP's nemesis, which is kind of funny as the two would later develop one of my favorite friendships across all franchises. She showed right off the bat that she was funny and self-deprecating and had a self-awareness to her that we don't often see in Housewives. She felt a natural kinship to Camille as both were going through divorces with actors. She's like the A-list version of what I went through, which is like the D-list version. The other women found her a bit crass, but when fellow friend of Dana, also known as Pam, planned a game night for the ladies, things got a bit nasty. Kim and Kyle were paired up with Brandy and they weren't shy to hide their distaste for her. Brandy fired back, accusing Kim of being on drugs. At least I don't do crystal meth in the bathroom all night long, bitch. And things escalated considerably, giving us some of the most memorable Beverly Hills quotes of all time. You're a pig. Okay, You're enough. A slut no pig. one is touching. Though she and Kyle would quickly make up, Kim wouldn't let things go, and the two maintained their feud for a good while before also becoming best friends for a time. After this initial confrontation, Brandy would just be a fun character for most of the season, causing the other women to clutch their pearls at her comments while the main drama shifted to Camille vs. Taylor. When the cast took a trip to Hawaii, LVP and Brandy started to bond as their sense of humors played off each other really, really well. I also think LVP saw Brandy's unfiltered mouth as a major asset, though that's a video for another day. In the reunion, Brandy really showed out and secured her spot on the show going forward. Eddie Cibrian says you slid his tires. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I think it's incredible that she was able to make such a splash, all while being just a friend, especially on a cast of heavy hitters dealing with some of the biggest storylines we've seen across the entire franchise's run. In ninth place is Monique Samuels from The Real Housewives of Potomac. 
Now, I think Potomac is one of the toughest casts to join as it has such a strong OG cast that have really built strong foundations with each other, but Monique had the advantage of joining the cast early on in the show's run in season two. Monique brought wealth on a much more massive scale than we saw for many of the other ladies and wasn't shy to hide this. You don't have a home? I have four homes. Okay. I actually thought it was interesting seeing the wealth disparity of football money from Monique and basketball money from Sharice and Robin. To be fair, Robin and Juan had lost a lot of their money from a bad investment and Sharice was still incredibly wealthy, but Monique just seemed to be on another level. She was also incredibly beautiful and had a confidence about her. She exuded strength to me and was quick to win over most of the other ladies, except of course for Giselle Bryant with whom she had the most conflict with. Giselle is definitely a hazer and Monique was her first rookie victim, but Monique made it clear that she wasn't going to be intimidated by the green-eyed bandits. While she didn't make any super strong bonds, she fit in nicely with the rest of the cast and her feud with Giselle was entertaining to watch. She also had another feud with her mother-in-law. It was pretty heartbreaking to see how her husband's mother treated her, notably calling her a heifer behind her back and shaming her for not having a job outside of the home. Aside from her mother-in-law, Monique showed a really sweet bond with her family, throwing a birthday party for a one-year-old that would rival Taylor Armstrong's in spectacularness and which was full of chaos. Her relationship with her husband Chris was also sweet and stable and provided a good juxtaposition to some of the more chaotic relationships her castmates had. Even though Monique's big storylines would come in later seasons, we were set up with the duality that is Miss Samuels. She's simultaneously laid back and super type A. She's fancy and lives a high life, but still does her family's laundry. And when pushed, she's certainly not afraid to fight back. In eighth place is Margaret Josephs, who joined the Real Housewives of New Jersey in season eight, who breathed entirely new life into a series that had long gotten stale. Jersey had long been dominated by family drama and Italian culture. We had been starting to see a bit of a drift away from this, especially with the entrance the previous season with Siggy Flicker, but I feel that the entrance of Margaret was a signal that the show was diverting from its original roots. Margaret was a force right from the get-go. She came in with her signature blonde pigtails and colorful Lisa Frank-esque flair as a friend of Siggy's, but when she joined an episode one cast trip to Florida, she realized that Siggy was truly insane and jumped ship. This got entirely out of hand when she planned a tender moment for Teresa, who had just lost her mother. Siggy and Dolores were left out, though they really just didn't answer the text inviting them, and things got ugly with Siggy totally turning against Margaret and devoting all of her energy into taking her down. Margaret didn't sweat this and jabbed right back. Siggy, or better known as Soggy Flicker with all the crying. This ramped up when Margaret made an analogy using Hitler, which didn't go over well with Siggy. She found the remarks to be anti-Semitic, though nobody else seemed to agree with her. These types of accusations are hard to come back from, but I think most people saw that Siggy was being irrational, so the sympathy went towards Margaret. We did get a taste for the ice-cold jabs that Marge is known for today, but because they were directed towards Siggy, who had one of the biggest sophomore season falls, Margaret came out the victor. We also saw the blossoming relationship between her and Melissa, especially as they were both in the fashion business, as well as between her and Daniel Staub, though that wouldn't last long. She was in good with most of the other ladies besides Siggy and Dolores and had an interesting family dynamic. Her mother, Marge Sr., who is essentially a carbon copy of her, provided a lot of laughs, and she was really open about how her relationship with her husband was a result of an affair. Her husband's addition also meant that there was another Joe on the show. I think Marge brought in intellectualism and a savviness that had been glaringly absent from Jersey before she joined the show. She really livened things up and began the journey renaissance that would be furthered the next season with the additions of Jackie and Jennifer. Next up is Tiffany Moon from Dallas. Now, I'll keep this brief as I went pretty in-depth on Tiffany in my Dallas video, which I'll link below if you haven't seen it, but Tiffany brought a breath of fresh air to Dallas. She was one of the most accomplished women the show had ever seen as she worked as an anesthesiologist and had a very impressive path to getting there. Plus, she had an adorable family and a killer closet. Right from the jump, Tiffany was placed in a conflict-esque situation when she had to talk to Brandy about a video that had come out of her mocking Asian accents. Tiffany immediately let the audience and the other women into the struggle she faced growing up as a Chinese immigrant. She didn't majorly fight with Brandy outright, but the energy between the two is tense and awkward. Cameron, however, had kind of stepped into the lead role on the show after the exit of Leanne and the fading of Brandy, decided that Tiffany was a worthy opponent for her. During a dim sum brunch thrown by Tiffany, Cameron found Tiffany's insistence that they all try chicken sweet off-putting, and from there the two fought for most of the season. The audience for the most part sided with Tiffany, as Cameron's jabs seemed racially insensitive. The tension escalated on social media and at the reunion where Tiffany nabbed the first chair. She really 
had the other ladies sweating and handled a gang up from nearly all of them besides Deandra, which is not easy to do. Tiffany led us into her emotional world when she talked about the social anxiety she felt as well as with her complicated relationship with her mother. She was also funny and has a star quality that draws your eyes to her whenever she's on the screen. She seemed poised to take the lead position if the show had continued on. In sixth place is OC's Megan King Edmonds, who came on the scene in season 10. Now, Megan was set up to fail. She was much younger than the rest of the cast, barely over 30 years old, and the cast, namely Vicky and Shannon Bedore, didn't let her forget it. But Megan proved she wasn't one to be shamed or pushed around. She was quick to stand up for herself and call out disrespect when she first got into it with Shannon over charity event drama. I start charities, Megan. Look. She wasn't afraid to go toe-to-toe with the Titans, and you've got to respect that. Megan really began to shine, however, when she began investigating Vicky's boyfriend, Brooks's alleged journey with cancer. She used her millennial powers for good, digging up old blogs, talking to Brooks's exes, and contacting medical centers to get the real scoop on the situation. This took a lot of bravery, as for a while she was villainized for being the one accusing Brooks of not having cancer, but as the other ladies began to feel something was off themselves, Megan was eventually vindicated. She was the one who truly brought us this storyline, which is just unforgettable, as I'm not sure the other ladies would have gone forward with it themselves. Not only was she great with the ladies, her personal storyline was also super compelling. She was a newlywed, the third wife to famed baseball player Jimmy Edmonds, and it was clear right from the bat that there was trouble in paradise. Jim, along with his teenage daughter, seemed to find Megan to be the most annoying person in the world, leaving viewers to wonder how these two had just gotten married. We also saw her having to take on the role of stepmother to her stepdaughter, of whom she wasn't that much older than, which was a story we hadn't seen much before on The Housewives, and also caused tension specifically with Vicky, who got insanely offended at Megan's motherly perception of herself. Megan was able to hold her own against the OG and came out victorious as she unraveled the cancer scam. I think Megan was a breath of fresh air, standing out on what was already a phenomenal cast in the heyday of OC's golden era. She was much smarter than people expected at first glance, choosing her words wisely and maintaining a steady, rational mind in every conflict she entered. I definitely think this was her strongest season, as she faded into the background as she took on a motherhood journey of her own, but her performance in season 10 was just astounding and paved the way for many millennial housewives to come. Fifth place goes to Kelly Dodd, who stepped onto the OC scene in season 11. With the beginning of the season, Vicky was majorly on the outs after the disastrous Cancergate storyline that dominated the latter half of season 10. Kelly was brought into the group by Megan King Edmonds, but when she saw Vicky was being ostracized, she made the unpopular choice to befriend her, despite Megan's urgings that it was a bad choice. I think this decision is actually pretty typical of Kelly now that we've gotten to know her much better. There's a lot that can be said about her, but she surely isn't afraid to go against the grain, no matter the ramifications. Right from the get-go, Kelly didn't really click with Shannon, who didn't appreciate her childish sense of humor. Are you in a fitness? Yeah! Fit, try fitness in your mouth. <laughs> but things went absolutely haywire when Shannon hosted a 70s-themed party. Some friends of Shannon started antagonizing Kelly, who suspected the whole thing was a setup to make her look bad, and Kelly went off, proving what we know now, which is that she's not afraid to go straight for the whitest part of a person's meat. You know what? No wonder why you're, you cheated on your wife. Even though she tries to make amends with Shannon, it doesn't succeed, and she's left mostly on the outs with Vicky for a while. This is made worse when she once again has an outburst at a sushi party where she uses words not to Heather Dubrow's liking. This is low it is. face bullshit, it and is. I am not doing this. Kelly, this is not okay. It isn't until a trip to Glamis Dunes where things start to shift a bit. Kelly, Tamara, Heather, and Vicky crash while out on a dune buggy, forcing Tamara and Vicky to go to the hospital. When Vicky had to stay overnight, a shaken but okay Kelly and Heather requested that Shannon and Megan, who had wiggled out of the trip, go visit her, but neither of them would take the bait as they were still mad at Vicky over Cancergate. This made both Heather and Kelly livid and drove them together along with Tamara, leading to the villain role being thrust from Vicky and Kelly onto Shannon and Megan. Kelly had earned back most of the women's friendship by the time they took their cash trip to Dublin, but when the ladies went out for a bar crawl, things got absolutely out of control. Kelly was going up to the other women and flicking their noses, which the others understandably found annoying. In a drunken haze, Kelly and Tamara got into it, and once again, the fight turned overly nasty. No wonder why her daughter doesn't talk to her. After this, Kelly was totally isolated on the trip, with the exception of when the other women tried to get her drunk multiple times to make her look even worse. Things totally blew up late on the last night of the trip after the cameras went down. The other women left Kelly out of the last night of drinking together, leading to confrontations captured on cell phone cameras. 
When the ladies got into the van to head to the airport, all hell broke loose when Kelly decided to reveal everything Vicky had been telling her over the past few months. Even though the women were mad at Kelly, Vicky became the true big bad and she was once again left on an island. This was a nonstop action season and lover or hater, Kelly was the catalyst for a lot of it. Even though Kelly has her enemies, I think her biggest conflict is with her own lack of impulse control. We see a pattern of, to quote Lisa Rinna, rage and regret that would be shown throughout Kelly's entire time on the show. In fourth place is supermodel of the world, Joanna Krupa, who joined the Real Housewives of Miami in season two and immediately became the main character, which is no easy feat on a cast with women like Adriana DeMora and Leah Black. Just look at how Peacock advertises this season. She also got the first tagline and the first chair at the reunion. Right from Joanna's first scene, we get a sense of exactly what to expect from her, which was a whole lot of drama and toxicity. She's having an absolute meltdown because she finds out that the photo shoot she's doing is not for the cover as she was initially told. I'm the cover girl, like I'm a cover girl, over 120 covers worldwide. I didn't come from two covers in Ocean Drive to an editorial. From there, she has a constant conflict with everyone around her. She's always having issues, whether it be with her sister Marta, her fiancé Roman, or of course the other ladies, specifically Adriana, with whom she got in a physical altercation at a lingerie charity event. Joanna's on this list because she completely revitalized Miami. After a clunky first season, Joanna, along with one season wonder Karen, kept things in constant turmoil. Joanna was compelling because even though she fought with everyone, her true conflict was with herself. We saw numerous sit-downs with Roman after she had some sort of freak out with her resolving to behave, that she would stop drinking yet she continued to do it again and again. I think this tendency to self-sabotage, especially with a woman who is so beautiful and seems to have it all, makes for a very interesting character to watch. She was an extremely passionate person, notably being super invested in animal rights causes as well as an immigrant, talking pretty openly about her experiences in moving to the country and having to step into more of a motherly figure to her younger sister, who often tested her deep-rooted need for loyalty. I think Joanna's toxicity got to be a bit much to take on after a while, but she really changed the game in her rookie season. On to our top three. Third place goes to Miss Shannon Storms Bedore, who joined the cast of The Real Housewives of Orange County in season nine. She had possibly the strangest introduction ever when Heather Dubrow showed up to see her secret passageway room. She had one of the easiest integrations onto the show ever, with Vicky taking to her since they were both Aries and Tamara taking to her because they both like taking shots. I think it also helped that the ladies were eager for new blood with the exits of Gretchen and Alexis and preferred Shannon much more to fellow newbie Lizzie Robsick. There was one housewife who didn't take too kindly to Miss Vidor, and that was her introducer, Heather Dubrow. I went into detail on my speculation into the goings-on and the dynamic in their relationship in my OC video, which I'll link below, but I think this could be partly due to how easily Shannon clicked with Tamara and Vicky. There was a mini Heather takedown at the beginning of this season, and Heather, already feeling uncomfortable with the ladies, felt that she was being replaced in their triad. Shannon also had quite an intense personal storyline. Right from the moment we saw them together, we could sense that there was trouble brewing in her marriage to her husband, David. They were snappy with each other, and things escalated when Shannon received an email from him detailing his grievances in their relationship and his desire to take some time apart. Shannon mentioned it to Tamara, who told Heather, who talked about it in an off-camera lunch with non-housewives, and the whole thing got back to Shannon, furthering her feud with Heather and leading to some very memorable moments. We're done. Please leave. I'm asking you to leave. This rocky marriage storyline would sustain itself for a few seasons, as it's later revealed in season 10 that David had been having an affair the whole time Shannon was filming season 9. Shannon was also pretty essential to the infamous Tamara takedown in Bali. While this was mainly Lizzie's doing, I don't think it would have gone so crazy without Shannon's support. I really feel that this season was a shift in the franchise, partly due to the exits of Gretchen and Alexis, but also due to Shannon's entrance. She gave a suburban housewife in a way we hadn't seen since the early seasons of the show. She cooked dinner for her family and was focused on the kids' schedule, not working outside of the home. She just felt like such a mom to me. She also brought kookiness with her devotion to holistic medicine and greenifying her home. She's a true OC all-star, and her first season was just transcendent. Let's move on to our runner-up. In second place, we have Heather Dubrow, who joined the Real Housewives of Orange County in season seven and immediately made her mark on the show. She was introduced by Tamara when she was looking at massive lots to build a massive house, though the lot ended up not being to the Dubrow's liking. Right off the bat, we knew that she was extraordinarily wealthy, sophisticated, and articulate. We hadn't really seen a housewife like her on OC, and we haven't seen anyone like her since. Most of the other women took to her right off the bat, with the exception of Alexis, who found her pretentious and was possibly threatened by Heather's wealth and social status. This is my favorite of all of Heather's seasons, as she's still a bit green and more of an outraged observer than a participant in the drama. Seeing her reactions highlights the absurdity of what exactly is going on. 
There are rumors that it was really her husband, Terry, who wanted her on the show, and we can see that even though he's a very busy plastic surgeon, he still makes time to get in the mix and has his own drama with Jim Bellino. There's actually a funny scene of the two of them at dinner early on talking about her upcoming painting party, where it's clear he's watched the show and Heather is trying to cover it up a little bit. What if they get drunk and they start throwing paint on each other or something? Why would they do that? Heather is also very sentimental, which leads to some funny moments like when she goes to the DMV to change her last name to Terry's, and nobody working there cares even in the slightest at this momentous occasion she's currently facing. That seems so permanent. <laughs> We also see this through the epic Kate Gate confrontation in the season finale in which hanger on that season Sarah classlessly eats the bow off Heather's cake and she goes absolutely ballistic. It's one of my favorite conflicts ever on The Housewives. We also saw a taste for the supervillain potential inside of her when she encourages the other women to have an intervention for Alexis who is facing a takedown season. All of her reactions to Alexis are just fantastic, honestly. She doesn't seem that cerebral to me. I think the big draw of Heather, though, is her sophistication and glamour. She can't help but put a fancy spin on bowling and 80s-themed parties. She takes a helicopter to LA to run her errands. That, combined with her East Coast vibes, makes her a bit of a fish outside of water on the OC scene, but she's so confident that she makes the other ladies seem more out of place than she is. Her addition was a fantastic casting choice, and I firmly believe that all the seasons she's on OC are better than the season she's not. And now, our number one, who I'm sure you already know, is Kenya Moore, who joined season five of The Real Housewives of Atlanta and stole the show completely on a cast of very heavy hitters. It's Moore, Obama, Clinton, Kennedy. I'm a part of history. Understand that. I'm gone with the win. Right from the beginning, Kenya was causing chaos, calling for security and making speeches at Cynthia's model call. She immediately got into it with fellow newbie Portia, finding her to be too cheerleadery and taking offense when Portia used a wrong beauty pageant title for her. She had major drama with her boyfriend Walter, with whom she was hoping to elope with on a couple's trip to Anguilla until they broke up and she accused him of being gay and stalking her. She had major beef with Phaedra, flirting with her husband openly. I was like, hmm, Apollo, he's kind of fine. And then creating warring booty workout tapes. We saw the foundation of her close friendship with Cynthia laid out and got glimpses into her tragic relationship with her mother, though it would get a little bit more fleshed out with later seasons. This season was truly all about Kenya. When she wasn't on the screen, the other ladies were constantly talking about her. Even the husbands couldn't shut up about her. I think this season truly encapsulated the beauty and pain that is Kenya Moore. She has this incredibly silly side, while also taking deep-rooted jabs from the other ladies. She's wronged a lot, but is wrong a lot. She also seems to have a producer's mentality, knowing what will and what won't work to produce fantastic television, without seeming put on the way some housewives do. Even if people don't like Kenya, they still feel strongly about her, which I think is a testament to how influential she is. I thought it was interesting to note that this season, even though Nini was technically a full-timer, she was kind of a reverse friend of. Kenya easily filled these shoes and solidified herself as a star of the show. So let's wrap this up with some closing thoughts. I think a common theme a lot of these women have is that they're very forthright with their emotions, and a lot of them have their biggest conflict truly with themselves. We had a much higher representation from OC, but I think that makes sense given that it's been on the longest, so there's a lot of women to choose from, and they truly had a great run in that middle era. Obviously, there was no Salt Lake City representation, as my only option was Jenny Wynn, who, even if we just look at her on-screen behavior, didn't warrant inclusion on this list. There also wasn't much in the way of Beverly Hills. I considered Rinna, Erica, and Sutton, but I think they ramped up a bit more with their later seasons. I think a similar thing happened with Atlanta. Even though there were some women who stole the show right away, most people in Atlanta take a little longer to settle in and make their presence known. Atlanta's also more apt to bring people back, so a lot of the glory goes to the veterans. I think Jackie and Jennifer from Jersey could have made the list had I extended it to 15 or 20, but I think they too started really shining as they got a bit more integrated onto the cast. But I'd love to hear from anyone watching who you think deserves a place on the list. We're all drawn to different people, and we'll all find different rookie performances more impressive than others. So that about does it for me. If you like the video, please subscribe to the channel, and a huge thank you to everyone who already has. I love making these videos and seeing other people's thoughts on The Real Housewives. If you want to connect on social media, my Twitter and Instagram are both at deeplysuperfish. But I will look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye!